Hello, so welcome back, everyone. Those of you who made it back after that terrifying journey through pointers to the glorious land of RAII. Um, in this module, we're going to be uh, introducing a few pieces of the C++ standard library to try and give you a taste of uh, the amazing piece, uh, parts that compose it. So yeah. um, our module overview, uh, we're going to start off with a very brief uh, introduction to templates. So uh, we're, just, we're not going to go into very much depth. You could write whole books on templates. In fact, people have. Um, but we're just going to go into the bare minimum that you need to understand to be able to write C++ using the standard library. We'll then show std vector, which is one of the standard library classes and one of them that you should probably be using more often than practically anything except perhaps string. Um, we're going to show you some useful functions and function templates uh, and then show how they're used with iterators, which are another concept that we'll introduce from the standard library. We'll then show off lambdas, uh, which are a new feature of C++11. Um, and finally, we're going to uh, just basically talk about the basics of you know, how you can learn, uh, this, learn to use all of these components of the standard library once, and you can use them everywhere because they're supported on basically every C++ implementation in existence, and most of them are um, extremely high quality. Like, you know, you'll, certainly there's bugs, but not, not many. They're mm -hmm. rare. So let's start off talking about templates. So we saw before how you can get polymorphism by using inheritance. So you can derive from a base class and use virtual functions uh, to, um, to get polymorphism. Templates uh, provide you a way of getting what's called compile time polymorphism. So they allow you to define a class or define a class or a function that operates on different kinds of types. So for example here in this slide, we have this uh, template. Uh, it's called a function template uh, and it's named add. So what this means is, is that this template um, is instantiable with any type t. So it takes two of these t's as, uh, as arguments and it adds them together. So for example, we could call this function template with, um, with two ints and it would do integer addition and return an int. Or we could call it with two doubles and it would do you know, floating point addition and return a floating point value. Um, we could do it with, uh, I guess that's all I really have. Uh, we could do this, string. actually we could do this with strings. So we could uh, pass in two strings and it would concatenate them together and return the result. So basically this works with any, two, any type that uh, supports the plus operator. Um, so it works, and again, because it works with std string, it works with fundamental types and user-defined types. Um, basically, all modern C++ developers and all modern C++ code use templates. Uh, we've already seen some templates. Uh, if you remember our unique putter example in the last, um, in the last module showed uh, the use of a template. It used angle brackets to say this is a unique putter to a, uh, an int. A squawker. squawker. I take that back. It was to a squawker. Uh, but we could have written one also to an int. Um, so the biggest advantage of templates is that basically you get this compile time genericity, but you don't, uh, you don't uh, sacrifice type safety. So it's as if this is a cookie cutter, this add function template, and when we want to uh, instantiate it and we want to call it with ints, then it's like we use that cookie cutter to go stamp out a new function that takes ints. Or if we want to call it with doubles, then we go stamp out a new function that takes uh, doubles. So we have to write the code only once, and we can reuse it for any number of types. So Kate is going to give a little demo showing off some of the awesomeness of templates. For sure. Now, I, I'm going to show you how to write a template first, because I don't want you to think that they're, they're magical. But you know, this is the only template we're going to make you write. Uh, everything else we're going to do in this module is going to be about using templates. And uh, the only thing better than only having to write a function once and have it work across all the different types of the universe is having to write a function zero times and having it work across all the different types of the universe, which is really uh, what the STL gives us. So if you take a look at this project that I have, um, there's the code from the slide. This function's called add, and instead of returning an int or a double or a string, it returns a t, and t is sort of a placeholder. And there's actually no rule that the placeholder has to be called T, but everybody calls it T. It's, yeah. just, it's just a habit. And if you have more than one, often people call them T and U and V, or sometimes right. people do T0, T1, T2. So. Right. I mean, the compiler doesn't care, but, but humans are going to read your code cares. But whatever add uh, takes, whether it's two ints, two strings, it's the same. The first parameter is of type T, and the second parameter is of type T, and the return type is also of type T. So take a look at my main here where I'm going to exercise add a little bit. And I've got three lines of code exercising add. I'm going to call add 3, 4 and use that to initialize an integer. 
I'm going to call add at 1.1, 2.2, and use that to initialize a double. And I'm going to call add with some strings. Uh, the reason I have to make a string brace bracket this is because of an artifact of old C that when you type a quoted string like this, you don't actually get a standard string. Just trust. So let's run and watch these things work. I'll run to a comment. That'll be useful. So after these three lines have run, you can see that I has the value 7, which is what 3 plus 4 is, and D has the value 3.3 .3 to the precision that we have, which is what 1.1 plus 2.2 .2 is, and S has the value hello space world, which is what hello space plus world is. So this function was written exactly once, and right away it can handle ints, doubles, and strings. And if we were to invent our own types like nuclear reactor or insurance policy, and we happen to explain what plus meant for adding two nuclear reactors together, uh, then we could use add with those objects as well. Now take a look at the line that's commented out here. It's commented out, as you may have guessed from my demos, I comment lines out when they won't compile. So let's uncomment it. I'm trying to call add passing it this string s and the integer 2. And it's saying here, I, I don't know what to do. There, I can't figure out how to generate the template, what cookie cutter to stamp out. When you gave me two integers, I knew that t was int, and I knew what to do. When you gave me two doubles, I knew that t was double. But here they're different, and I don't know what to do. And so that's why this line doesn't compile. So we're not giving up type safety. This will work with anything, but we can make our rules like it has to understand plus or they have to both be the same or whatever rules we want to have on our template. And the rest of this demo, I'll show you later. Let's go back to James. Excellent. So function templates are not the only kind of template. You can also have class templates. And like we said, we had the uh, unique putter example in the last one. Um, std vector is another example of a class template. So a std vector is a collection, or as it's called in C++, a container uh, that stores elements that are all of the same type. So for example, we could have a std vector of ints, and it would store a, you know, a sequence of integers. Um, it's an ordered collection, so you know, if you keep adding integers to it, then they'll keep getting appended onto the back. Um, it resizes itself automatically when you add more. So when you create it, you don't need to know how many elements you're going to have. Um, as you add more elements, it will just keep resizing the underlying array, or the underlying storage that it uses. And the advantage of this is that, um, and it, well, so it does so in a way that is, is as efficient as possible. So it tries to balance, you know, oh, I haven't allocated too much space uh, versus, oh, I'm reallocating too often, so I'm having to move things around in memory a lot. Um, so it works with the range for loop, which we'll demonstrate, and it works with a variety of uh, other functions and operators. So Kate is going to now demonstrate the, uh, the basics of std vector. So picking up the demo right where I left it off and taking a look at these two lines uh, that follow that line that won't compile, I think you can probably just read this. Vector angle bracket int, vector angle bracket double, one's a vector of integers and one's a vector of doubles. There's those angle brackets again. You saw them here in defining and writing the template, but never mind that for the moment. You saw these in the unique pointer where we said a unique pointer of squawker and it was surrounded with angle brackets. And way, way back in module one, we did the static cast to int with angle brackets. So you've been kind of soaking in it in that you've been seeing code that uses templates that we didn't have to write from the very beginning. So this local variable, which is named integers, is a vector of integers. And this one labeled doubles is a vector of doubles. And again, we're just choosing these names. They could be called new staff or um, important paychecks to write, and they could still be the vector of these types. This is a lovely way to initialize vectors, at least in demos. Uh, you've seen initializing with brace brackets and common variables that go into the individual elements of a class. Here, uh, I'm going to end up with this vector is going to have four elements in it, and those are going to be the four integer values that will be in that vector. And the same with this one. I'm going to have these four elements put into my vector of doubles. And you're not limited to four. You could have no. 10 million if you wanted, if you, if you really <laughs> wanted 10 million numbers in your code. But, <laughs> that would work yeah. for you. Yeah, typically in sampled cases, you know, we make really short vectors, three, five, seven, because uh, we get fed up with typing more than that. Uh, but you will occasionally see people uh, creating vectors and initializing them in this way. Now, vectors are smart. Not only do they keep stuff 
uh, in memory in the order that you added them and make room for more when you want to add more, they know their own size. So let's run down to this line. I can hover over integers and you see it says size equals 4 and then if I hover again it'll actually show me the individual elements and vectors are zero based so element 0 is 3 that's the first element element 1 is the second element element 2 is the third element element 3 is the fourth element this is why I like going to Europe you know they're a, they're a zero based country yeah, yeah I noticed that naturally yeah. more C++ -y than we are so you can see the size here in the debugger but that's not a special capability of the debugger the uh, vector actually knows its own size so here I've called that integers vectors dot size method and returned the value into i length of 4. And d length is also 4, but that's just a coincidence. So to put more elements onto the vector, I can use this pushback method. It's a kind of a weird name, but uh, it's a, a historical, really. It adds more elements to the end of the vector. So at the moment, integers has got 3, 7, 11, and 23 in it. After I push back minus 3, integers has 3, 7, 11, 23, and minus 3. And it knows its new size is 5. And then just to be on the safe side, I push something else on. Now if I check what is eye length again, it now successfully knows that it's 6. So this is what's cool about vectors, that they understand their own needs, make themselves bigger if they need to. The size was only 4, now the size is 6. If you want to ask it how big it is, not a problem. And that makes them uh, very simple and easy to use. You don't need a separate variable in which you keep track of how many times you've pushed something onto this vector. If you want to access an individual element of the vector, you can use the square bracket operator. And remember, I said it was zero based. So I can say integers at zero, that'll be the first element, which is currently got the value of three, plus plus. That's going to reach right down into the heart of the vector and increment that integer. So when we step over and look again, now it's 4. It was incremented. And of course, I can pull things out. I'm going to declare a variable called third and initialize it using this integers at 2, which will be the third element. And I'm making it auto because I want to prove that you can. The compiler knows this vector of integers contains only integers, and the compiler is therefore capable of figuring out that third is an int. So if I step over that, you can see the third is 11. Let's take a look. Yep, code still works. Now, these are the for loops that you saw in module two, the ones with three parts. The initialization, when to, whether or not it's okay to keep going, and how to move to the next one. So since you've learned about these square brackets, you could say one way to go through the whole vector would be to use some sort of loop variable i and start from 0 until we get to however many are in the vector and go through accessing integers square bracket i. And that code does totally work. What I'm trying to do here is to add up all of the elements of my vector. So I'll initialize total to 0 and go through the loop over and over again saying total plus equals this element and we'll go until uh, i is less than size. Remember that integers.size is 6 right now, so we'll go from 0 till we're less than 5. No, till we're less than 6, so 0 through 5, which is 6 times. And that works. I'm just going to skip over it, and the total is 64. But I don't like it. Why don't I like it? Well, there's a lot of places for me to mess up. I could accidentally start at 1 instead of 0. I could accidentally do less than or equal to instead of less than. I could forget to increment. I could try to get smart and increment in here. That's how I usually see people messing themselves up. I could even accidentally uh, get this operator wrong and say equals instead of plus equals. So when you're working with a collection that supports it and vector does, there's a better for loop available to you, and this is called the ranged for. Right away, without looking at the syntax, here's something to like. Look how much less typing there is in the ranged for. Look how much shorter this line is than this line. This syntax means for every element in integers, which is of type int. I mean, not that some of them aren't, but you, I'm telling the compiler that uh, lm is an int. I could also just say auto here, and it would figure it out because it knows what the elements of the collection are. And I could even make it a const auto ref not that this matters for integers, 
and it would do that too. This is actually the best practice for using range to four. Since I changed the code, I'm just going to be nice to it and run it, rebuild. So this much shorter range to four, if I step down and run down to here, total two is 64, the same as total. So they get the exact same answer, but I just didn't have to write as much code, and I like that. Yep. Yeah, the less code you have to write, the better. So that said, though, for loops are somewhat limited in you know what they're able to express. So you know when you see a for loop, it has you know that header, and you can see okay, we're maybe iterating over all these elements. But as Kate noted, you know you can change that. Uh, you can change the induction variable, the i inside the loop accidentally. Um, we haven't shown, but you can actually break out of a loop, or you can skip certain iterations from within the loop. Uh, you could return from the function within the loop. So in order to find out what you're actually doing, you have to read the entire loop. Like to figure out, oh, what is this for loop doing? What, you know, is it actually correct? You have to read the entire loop. And so one way of, you know, making this simpler and making it easier to work with um, is using what are called algorithms. Now, there's the general, you know, idea of algorithms, which is just, you know, a set of steps to accomplish a task. But um, algorithms in the, in the scope of the STL, um, the, the at least with containers like vectors or sequences of elements, um, algorithms are completely detached from containers. So, for example, um, sort is a good algorithm. Um, we wouldn't want to have to write a, a for loop to go and sort, you know, things. Uh, further, we we don't want sort to be a uh, a member function of a vector um, because there's other containers. So vector is just one example of a container, but a string is also you know a, a sequence of characters. So maybe we want to sort all the characters in a string to put all the a's together and the b's and the c's. Um, similarly, there's other data structures uh, that generally you don't use uh, in your code, but like there's a list data structure, there's a deck data structure. Um, and we want to be able to use the same uh, function, basically the same functionality to sort all of these different types of things. And so to do that, we use what are called algorithms. So these are function templates, um, and they can operate on basically any, any type of range of elements. So you could plug in you know, a range of elements from a vector, or you can plug in a range of elements from a string. Um, and they come from, so in the standard library, they're defined in header files like uh, the numeric header, which def uh, defines an algorithm that we'll look at in a moment. Uh, also, the algorithm header defines most of the common algorithms. There's maybe 25 or 30 algorithms uh, in the standard library. Um, so these can help you to avoid writing your own loops to traverse a, a collection. So as we'll see in a moment, these algorithms make it really easy. You can look at the first word, which is the name of the algorithm, and know exactly what the code is going to do if you know what that algorithm does. For example, if you say sort and then you pass it you know, a, a range from a container, you know, oh, it's going to sort the elements in that container. Um, the, the most important feature is that this, supports, um, this, this works with any container that supports iterators. So iterators are the way of abstracting how data is stored uh, and separating it from how we operate on data. So basically, you know, we want to be able to store um, data in all sorts of different ways. In a vector, we store it uh, in an array underneath. Um, in a string, we also store it in an array. But there's other, there's other kinds of data structures for storing sequences of data. Then we have these operations that don't really care how the data is stored. They just want to be able to access element 0, then element 1, then element 2. You know, or be able to access elements randomly in the, in the collection. And so the way that we bind those together is through iterators. So containers expose a member function, uh, two member functions, named begin and end. So begin gives you an iterator to the first element in the collection, so you know, the initial element. And end gives you an iterator, uh, it's one past the end, but it's basically to the end of the collection. Um, and so you can feed these iterators into, these, into the algorithms and be able to um, basically use any of these generic algorithms, which are function templates, uh, with any kind of collection of data. And so, you know, if you think about it, if we didn't do it this way, we would have to write a sort function for every single container that we have. We would have to write a, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see in a moment, a find function or um, all these different types of functions for each type of container. And by uh, having this separation of logic on the one side and data storage on the other side, and having iterators bind them, we only have to write all the logic once, we only have to write each of the containers once, and we can combine them all in the middle. So we basically, we get this multipl multiplicative effect where we can use all of these algorithms and all of these containers together and get, uh, basically get much more bang for our buck with the amount of code. So Kate is going to show a couple examples of using, uh, using standard library algorithms. Absolutely. 
uh, let's just review. Remember, we had this loop first, which you know stretched out across most of the screen and had several different places in it where I could get it wrong. And then we had this simpler ranged loop. This is simpler because it's guaranteed to visit every element of the collection exactly once. So there's less reading. I don't need to see if I skip any or stop early or anything like that. But it's still quite a lot of code when you compare it to this. This is a call to the standard function accumulate. And accumulate takes uh, an iterator. A, a, a iterators are, you can think of a little bit like pointers. It's not how they're implemented, but you can think of it like that. So this is the beginning of the integers array. This is the end of the integers array. And the third parameter, which IntelliSense will tell you about if you start to type it, is the starting value of the total, this zero and this zero. Now, there's, first of all, way less places to make mistakes because it's just less code. Uh, begin integers and end integers is almost a sort of a ritual incantation. I want to work over the whole array. That's what I'm going to do. And if, in fact, I were to mix and match and were to accidentally go from begin of integers to end of doubles, I'd get a compiler error. It's very hard to make a mistake here. And when I step over this line, total 3 is also 64. So rather than writing this complicated loop, this complicated loop, I just write one line of code. And expressivity is really key. You know, when you see something that says sort, you kind of get the feeling that maybe it sorts something. When you see something that calls find, you think, hmm, I think they're trying to find something here. And accumulate, maybe you wouldn't think of as being to mean running total. But once you've learned it once, then you know that's what accumulate does. Now, I thought I'd show you a couple more fun games with vectors. This is the sort of thing that people do in demos all the time. Consecutive, it's a set of consecutive vectors. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Well, how much fun was that? And what if, what if I did want 100? So uh, I thought I'd show you this function here called iota, which is uh, Greek for a little bit. And it has one job, which is it'll go through this range from the beginning to the end of my consecutive 2 vector. This is the starting value. So if I step and step, consecutive 2 is 0 through 9. I got 10 elements. Why do I care? Why would I bother? Well, what if I change this to 100? I wouldn't want to type the numbers 0 through 99 into my code, but IOTA will cheerfully generate me the numbers 0 through 99 to put into my vector of 100 elements. So IOTA is a very handy way to fill your vectors up with goodness. We don't always just put things into vectors. Sometimes we need to take them out for whatever reason. Uh, you're probably not going to write a whole lot of vectors of int in your life, to be honest. Uh, what you tend to write vectors of is objects that do something helpful. So maybe these are uh, orders that need to be processed. And after an order has been processed, you're going to erase it from the collection. And erase takes an iterator. So right now, consecutive is 0 through 9. And if I step over this line that erases the first element, now consecutive is 1 through 9 and there's only nine elements in it. I can do some really uh, elementary arithmetic, begin plus two or begin plus four to the end. So when I go on begin plus two, oops, here's begin plus one plus two. So expect to see the three disappear. And the three has disappeared. And then when I want to go begin plus four till the end, Begin plus 4 is here, so I'll see 6, 7, 8, and 9 all disappear in that one line of code. And that's what's happened. And I've seen code where people make vectors, and then they, they copy from one vector to the new one, the new smaller one, with some condition. And it says, I have to go through the loop and read it all over and go, oh, they're only copying some of them over. They're basically trying to delete some of them. I get it. Whereas if you call erase, you know, I, I can see what you're doing. It's right there in the name. Now, you don't just have to push back. You can insert at the beginning or anywhere else you want. So here I'm going to insert at the beginning plus 1. I'm going to insert the number 7. After I step over that line, you can see that's where it's been inserted. And James mentioned sort. What the heck? Let's sort uh, our doubles. Remember our doubles? Consec you know, consecutive is a big mess. It's nowhere near uh, uh, consecutive anymore. But remember these doubles? They're not in numerical order. The negative one should be at the beginning, right? So if I look at doubles now, and then step over and look at doubles again, the negative ones move to the beginning, and they're now in strictly numerical order. 
This method find will find a value inside your collection. And uh, the type it returns is an iterator, which is complicated, so I'm just going to use auto. And then I can dereference the iterator with star, just exactly like with pointers, and say, go find that uh, guy in the vector and change his value to 7.2. So after I step over that line and we look in doubles, the 77.2 has become 7.2. That's the uh, power of using algorithms rather than writing my own loops to sort, to find, to clean up, or whatever. It's more readable, and I fit an awful lot of stuff into a single page of code. Yeah, so I guess the one other thing that I would say about algorithms is, you know, there, there are other languages that have, you know, very generic um, types of algorithms that you can operate on generic containers of data. Uh, but one of the key advantages of the standard library algorithms in C++ is that there are no overhead. So it's practically guaranteed that no matter what type of data you work with, these what you use these for, uh, to work with, um, there's not going to be any overhead. Like you could not write something faster yourself, um, and that's actually quite unique. Like usually generic code has some overhead because you know it's handling the general case, not oh a specific case of integers or a specific case of doubles. Uh, but with, with the standard library algorithms, the advantage is, is that the compiler has type information all the way through. So it knows, you know, all the way down to the bottom, oh, this is, these are integers I'm working with, so I can do integer things that are faster than, you know, just generic object things. And so, like, realistically, there's very few reasons not to use the STL um, anywhere. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I know find and sort and count and accumulate and a handful of other useful ones. Um, but I just had the experience this year of learning some that I didn't know and saying, wow, uh, I'm not writing those loops myself anymore. I'm going to start using those, those algorithms that I didn't already know. And uh, there's really, um, for readability, for guaranteeing someone's checked all the edge cases, and for absolute performance, these are, these are totally the way to go. Yep. And those ones that Kate mentioned are, are largely the ones that are uh, the most important to know. Like 99% of the use of algorithms that you would use are sorting things or finding things or... Uh, you know, counting the number of elements in something, and a lot of problems are reducible to these. Like, for example, if you want to um, if you want to perform a certain operation on each element until you reach you know a ten, then you could do that with a find, right? Until you know you go search for the find, and for each element you do this operation. Um, but yeah, so it's it's extremely flexible. Uh, people could write whole books about it, and they have. Um, so certainly, if you were to pick up a copy of C++ Primer, it, co it covers most of the basics. And um, I would guess almost any mo recent text should you know, do a pretty good job. So next, we're going to cover um, a feature that's relatively new to C++. So it, it was introduced to C++ in 2011, uh, when the C++ 11 standard was finished. Um, we've had them in Visual C++ since uh, C Visual C++ 2010. Um, but what Lambdas are is they they basically give you a way to define unnamed functions. So you can define a function locally within another function. Uh, and they make using algorithms a lot easier because you can actually have some extra logic there. So you can do, um, uh, for example, if you wanted to change the way the sort happens, like if you wanted to sort elements in descending order, you could provide uh, a lambda there that does that sorting order. Um, so it's, it's especially useful for things like find if or count if, which are algorithms that uh, find, or like count if, for example, uh, f counts the number of elements uh, for which a certain you know, predicate returns true. Um, so for example, if you wanted to count all of the even elements, um, then you could write a little uh, lambda expression that shows you, uh, or that you know, tests if an element is even. So Kate is going to show um, a couple of examples of you know, what lambda's expressions look like, how they're used. People often say, and I'll warn you before you see the code, that uh, Lambda's fulfilled the desire of the C++ community to find more uses for punctuation. So uh, there will be even more punctuation, but it's in a good cause, okay? So be happy. Uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, first, this is not a Lambda. This is just a loop. Um, I, when we went looped through the integers, we said, okay, let's uh, add up all the integers. And then I said, ha ha, you can use accumulate. And you're like, oh, OK. Ah, but now what I'd like to do is loop through the doubles and multiply all the doubles together. So I'm going to go through for each double in the collection and product star equals d. So I'll multiply all the doubles together. Ha ha ha. But you can't do that with accumulate. Sure, I wrote the demo. I challenge accepted. Uh, <laughs> here's the call to accumulate. And like the accumulate that added, we have the range we want to operate over from the beginning to past the end of doubles, and a starting value, which is 1.0. If I typed 
one in here, I'd do integer math and get the wrong answer. 1.0. And then there's a fourth parameter. So you met the accumulate that takes three parameters. This accumulate takes four parameters. And the entire next line is the fourth parameter to that accumulate call. And what it is is essentially a little piece of code that says what to do to each element. Normally, when you write lambdas, you don't have a lot of control. Uh, it is, as James mentioned, an anonymous function. And the code you want to give it to is really usually in charge of what your function takes. So in the case of accumulate, you write a lambda. It's like a function in that it has round brackets here, the same as when you declare a function. But it's anonymous. There's no name here. There's these pair of square brackets, which in this context, I'm going to interpret as, hi, I'm a lambda because they always have to be here and they sort of alert the compiler what's going on. So the two doubles that were given, and it's doubles because product two is a vector of doubles and all of this is enforced by the compiler, is the, the partial result, the product that we're building so far, and then the particular element that we're going through in the vector. And what we have to write inside these brace brackets is what code we want to do with each element of the vector of doubles as we go through it. And what we want to do is multiply the partial result by the double we're handed, same as what you saw here. So if I run past this code, you can see that product is minus 51.3216 and product 2 is minus 51.3216. So it's exactly the same value. But again, this is less code than this. And this is less code to get wrong and uh, less of an opportunity to make errors. So it's a good use of accumulate. And James mentioned counting all the odd or even numbers I'm going to unpin Solution Explorer so I can have longer lines of code. I'm going to call a standard library function called count underscore if that takes the usual range beginning to end and the third parameter is a lambda. And this lambda takes an integer i because this is a collection of integers and we're going to go through the collection and count if will hand the lambda one number at a time and the lambda will return true or false. If it returns true, count if will say okay that's one. And if it returns true again, count if will say okay that's two. If it returns false, it, it won't increment the count. Another piece of punctuation. This one's not related to lambdas or the standard template library or anything. We just didn't mention it back in arithmetic. This is the modulo operator. And it returns you the remainder after dividing. So 3 divided by 2 is 1 with 1 remainder. But 4 divided by 2 is 2 with 0 remainder. The modulo operator just gives you the remainder. So any odd number mod 2 will be 1, and any even number mod 2 will be 0. So this returns true uh, for odd numbers and false for even numbers. So let's take a look at integers, see what it's got in it. It has three positive uh, odd numbers. My algorithm doesn't work for negative numbers. And if I step over this line, number odds is 3. When you read this line, count if it's odd. You're done. You're not reading a 10-line for loop trying to figure out what's oh, going through every one, it's checking if it's odd or not, it's incrementing the type. You can just read the words, and I like that. Uh, COUNTIF has a friend, COPYIF. If I make a fresh uh, vector of integers, and I'm going to just, I don't have to do this. I just felt like it. I'm going to uh, pre-allocate the size to be how many odds there are, and then I'm going to copy if it's odd into uh, this vector called odds. I step over those lines, and you look at odds, there are the three odd numbers, 7, 11, and 23. But you may have noticed I'm repeating myself, and we don't repeat ourselves, at least not if we can help it. So you can put a lambda in a variable, and this variable here is called isEven, and he holds the lambda that basically knows whether something's even or not. You don't want to know what the type of is even is. Uh, we call it unspeakable. It's actually not possible to press keys on the keyboard to declare its type. But who cares? Because we have auto. So I don't need to. Then I can call count if and copy if passing in just this is even lambda. And that will save me from repeating myself uh, as I did for the odds. So I'll just run down one more time to here and take a look at the evens. And not surprisingly, it has. 4 and 22, which were the even numbers from good old integers, 4 and 22. I hope you believe me that using these algorithms makes your code more readable and that using lambdas makes using algorithms feasible. They're really the key to me. Uh, some really smart people, people I really admire, started saying many, many years ago, 
Use algorithms. Don't write your own loops. Use algorithms. But before lambdas, the mechanism that we had to use, it scared a lot of people. And I wrote too many loops myself and didn't bother using the standard library just because I didn't want to use the mechanisms of things like function pointers and functors and things like that. Lambdas make this so readable. I can immediately see that I'm counting the odd ones. I don't have to go and look somewhere else in the code to see the rule. And it's really turned the door for me to making the standard library something I want to use in all my applications and something you should use in all your applications, too. It's also worth noting that uh, many people's first reaction to this code is, oh my gosh, that is like insanely weird. And certainly, there's like I can't think of a parallel from other pro from any other programming language where you pass you know a pair of iterators and then you pass you know this lambda thing and then you've got this generic algorithm. And I'm sure there are there are other implementations. Well, take the but, JavaScript when you say you know uh, for some uh, element on click equals and then you have little pieces of code with semicolons sure. in them. That's um, kind of like so that. Certainly, it, uh, lambdas and C++ are, are quite similar to uh, those in JavaScript in certain respects that they're uh, anonymous functions. But um, but even just like the general the algorithm idea that oh yeah. all of this logic is being encapsulated away and we're substituting pieces of it is um, it, it's a bit weird and it does take some getting used to. But overall, it makes code uh, substantially more maintainable. And so, highly recommend using uh, the standard library algorithms everywhere. They have names. And that's the number one thing I can say for them, you know? Sort, S-O-R-T, is kind of a clue as to what's about to happen here. And, you know, F-I-N-D, kind of a clue. And going through a loop yourself and saying, oh, it seems to have some sort of a counter, and then you're checking and incrementing the count. Oh, he's counting how many of them are odd. I get it. I, I go through other people's code for a living, and it can take embarrassingly long amount of time to figure these loops out when they're handwritten. Yeah. So as a, like, as a concrete example, I wrote a... Um or in my hobby time, I work on a C++ library, and uh, it's about, I don't know, 30,000 lines of code. Um, there are maybe 50 loops in it, and almost all of them are in tests. Like, it uses algorithms everywhere. Um, and it makes the code substantially easier to understand and also to debug, because when you're debugging through, you don't need to go and read the code and to figure out what yeah. it's doing. It's like, oh, I know what it's doing right off the top of my head. And like I said before, there's only a handful of algorithms that you use for most of it, like count and sort and find. And, and beyond those, you know, they're... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe accumulate, generate, IOTA, then we're done. Yep. I mean, I, I'd have trouble listing the top 10. Yep. I can make a top six or yeah. seven. That's <laughs> a, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, again, that all kind of leads into this last lesson, which is basically that, you know, it can take some getting used to to learn uh, these standard library features. Uh, but once you get used to them, once you learn them, once you start using them and get experience with them, uh, you'll find that uh, you'll use them everywhere. And that's because you can use them everywhere. Um, there's no need to learn different names or parameter orders. You know, if you go and write your own container because you have, you've discovered some magnificent new way to store data, you can reuse all of these algorithm, algorithms on top of it. Um, if you have some new algorithm you want to write, it's actually quite easy to write them. And if you look, um, you know, I don't usually recommend that people look at the source code of the standard library. It's rather horrific and terrible to look at because, you know, we try and encapsulate all of the, you know, horrible details of C++ like pointers so that you don't have to deal with them. Um, but if you look at some of the really simple algorithms, like count if, or uh, that we saw earlier, or sort, well, not sort, <laughs> but count, count if is a good example. Um, you know, you, you'll see that it's actually very straightforward. You know, it just has that loop internally, uh, but it prevents it. It keeps you from having to write that in your own code. So it's it's really beneficial there. Um, but definitely, there are a ton of algorithms. Like Kate said, she couldn't name more than you know maybe ten favorites, and I certainly couldn't name all of them, uh, even though I work with the code base you know day in and day out. Um, so you know you just need to learn the pieces that you use, learn the important pieces that you're familiar with. Um, you know, oftentimes I'll be hunting around Stack Overflow to see is there an algorithm to do you know whatever whatever, and I'll find I'll learn of a new algorithm and I'll use it in a one-off thing or. You know, or I'll learn it's really cool, like Accumulate I had never heard of. And then a few years ago I heard of it, and then suddenly I started seeing uses for it everywhere and started replacing loops with it. So it's, it's really useful from that respect. So we've got one more demo, because demos are amazing. Demos are amazing. But it, I wanted to give you some immediate benefit for starting to learn some of these algorithms. So I showed you them all with vectors. And some were with vectors of integers, and some were with vectors of doubles, but they were still all just vectors. James mentioned string is a container. So take a look at this last little block of code in here. I'm going to make a string called sentence. It's a little self-referential. It says this is a sentence being stored in a standard string instance, because I'm just geeky like that. But then I'm going to use count and find 
with begin of sentence and end of sentence instead of begin of integers and end of integers. And this is where life is really freaky because sentence is not a vector of characters. I mean, not to us. It doesn't expose pushback or any of the things you can do to a vector, but it has a begin and an end. And so I can step and say, what's the number of spaces? And it'll tell me, hover over the right thing, that there are nine spaces, and you're welcome to count and see if that's correct. So having learned count, you can use it on strings the same as on vector. And we haven't taught you list and map and hash map and all the other containers, but things like find and count work in other containers as well as vector. So there's only one learning lesson. Here we're going to use find and say, find me the colon in the sentence. Way up a couple lines up, we found the 77.2 in the vector of doubles. Now we're going to find the colon in the not vector that is sentence. But it works exactly the same way. And just as we dereferenced that iterator to get the value, so I can uh, dereference this one. And at colon, it's here somewhere. There it is. It is uh, ASCII 58, which the debugger helpfully lets me know is a colon, which just proves that it worked. So putting the time and effort in to learn any algorithm, not my top 10 or even anybody's top 1, but any algorithm that works that you learn on vector, you can turn around and take what you learn and use it on string or any other container that's STL compatible. It works with vectors and, uh, sorry, works with iterators the way these do. Yep. And I think to bring everything full circle to what we said at the beginning, um, you don't want to implement this stuff yourself. Um, like the implementation of vector is maybe 1,500 lines long uh, because it has you know all these operations and it has to be extremely careful you know to make sure that oh if an exception is thrown I don't you know leak memory or, or forget to destroy objects and, and other things like that um, you know there's a common concern and it's not a legitimate concern that oh some of this stuff is probably too expensive I should go implement my own it'll be it'll be faster or what have you but I mean we use this stuff in the in the Visual Studio IDE we use these in the compiler we use them in the operating system here at Microsoft I mean it's like literally you can use them almost anywhere and they are about as performant as you could ever possibly write yourself and the chances of you know you in your you know in, in your own programming writing something that is as fast and as correct which is more important than speed um, is highly unlikely. I mean, it's just... Yeah, I mean, someone's like, taken the time to consider every possible edge case and weirdness that you may forget to take into account. And uh, why write it yourself if someone else is willing to write it for you and exactly. test it for you and document yeah. it for you and all of those things? And then you get this compatibility. So once the container's been written, suddenly it works with all the algorithms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Ah, well, that brings us uh, to the end of this module. So we are going to take one last break, and then we'll come back, and uh, we're going to cover um, basically a list of things that we didn't cover, uh, some directions for going forward, and then we're going to show some examples of uh, cool software built in C++ uh, just to try to show you that it's, it's really not that scary, that it, uh, it's a powerful language, it has a lot of capabilities, and you can use those capabilities pretty easily to build cool software. Um, so we'll be back in 10 minutes, and we'll see you then. Thank you.